don't call it the bleak midwinter for nothing. As the nights close in and the weather turns, home can seem a long way away. But what saves me from a terminal decline is the knowledge that just around the corner is the irrepressible sparkle of Christmas. So Nick's may carp, but I wallow in it all. And the minute the city begins to transform itself with a festive sparkle, so does my Christmas kitchen. Cloves, cinnamon, and of course cranberries add a spicy depth to my star-topped mince pies. I need the velvety warmth of my roast squash and Stilton soup. And my star from the east, a gloriously spicy lamb tagine with dates, with its red onion, coriander and pomegranate relish. Here's my moment when at last I've got the time to enjoy being in the kitchen, cooking and sharing my table with friends. But the all-important thing is to hold on to all of that and not get overwhelmed by the burdens of feeding everyone. I know it's difficult, but you have an ally and your best friend at this time of year is the freezer. Time for a little drink, I think. The drink I need is my lychee. What it is, really, just a martini, but infused with the fragrance of lychee, which I think are very Christmassy. Right, get everything I need. Very simple. I do it by ratios, which means you can do either a glass or a pitcher. So one part chilled vodka, one part white rum, and two parts Creme de lychee. I mean, I know it's a fancy ingredient, but this time of year demands a little bit of excess. And I'm going to do what every barman would hate, and that's add some ice. And now my final touch, a little garnish of lychee. I'm using canned, I'm afraid, simply because when I peel a fresh lychee, I just massacre it, and I've got nothing to look pretty in the drink. It's so hard to describe the taste of a lychee. In fact, I don't think it's got a taste so much as a scent. It's like spring blossom at Christmas. Chin chin. Mm. Novelty is all well and good at this time of year, but Christmas is really about tradition. And this is where mince pies, my little startup mince pies, come in. I used to think that, you know, really it wasn't worth your effort making your own mince pies. And it wasn't so long ago I thought that. And it's true, you can buy perfectly decent mince pies at the shops. But I feel so safe and secure knowing that at Christmas I've got just a load of these stashed in my deep freeze. The thing is, not only are mince pies very easy to make, but it's just so gratifying. And this gorgeous feeling is all too easy to achieve. First, you've got to make your pastry. I make a very straightforward, plain pastry. I don't think mince pies need any sweet dough at all, nothing rich. Measure out 240 grams of plain flour into a dish, and into that flour, just cut up about 60 grams of chilled butter and little teaspoons of the same weight of vegetable fat, and sit that in the deep freeze for about 20 minutes. And it's that brief immersion in the deep freeze that makes the pastry so pliable and relaxingly easy to roll out, and later so tender and flaky to eat. And while the flour, butter, and vegetable shortening are in the deep freeze, squeeze an orange into a little jug, add a pinch of salt, and put that into the fridge. So after these 20 minutes, put the flour with the frozen fats into a freestanding mixer, and then start mixing until you've got what looks like a pale pile of rather porridge-like crumbs. And then once that happens, you start pouring in salted, chilled orange juice. I use the juice of an orange rather than just water for two reasons. One, because the scent of orange is just so Christmassy. 
also it's the acid in the orange that helps the pastry stay so tender. So when the dough's at this point of just looking like it's about to cohere into one whole, squidge it together and then form it into three fat little patties. Just wrap these in cling and put them in the fridge. If the pastry was simple enough, the mincemeat, real homemade mincemeat, is child's play. I mean, it's the work of moments. I mean, that's if you called us tipping things into a pan and letting them simmer work. We start off positively with some ruby port. Mm, look at that. Then some dark brown sugar, so treacly smelling. In the minute you put the heat on, you can smell that waft of mulled wine, which is essentially what's going on here. Now, my mincemeat is a slightly sort of modernised, lighter version even, which is surprising, I know. So instead of some grated cooking apple, I'm adding some fresh cranberries. I mean, you can use frozen, don't bother to thaw them. Ah, oh, look at those plumptious beauties. Right, spice, you need spice. Gotta have spice in mincemeat. Some ground ginger, a spoon, same of cinnamon, and half of ground cloves. And smelling this, you really sense the medieval origins of mincemeat. Let's give a stir so that all their gleaming redness is slicked in dark spiced syrup. Mm, I like it when it starts bubbling. Right, some dried fruit. You have to have dried fruit. That is essentially what mincemeat is. Some raisins. Sultanas. I never use mixed peel because I don't like it. And strangely, I'm not using suet here. So for once, I'm keeping company with a healthy living brigade. Very disconcerting. But this is actually, you know, quite light. But what's so fantastic about it is that it's rich and boozy but fresh and fruity at the same time. Some dried cranberries. Oh, these will glisten like garnets later. And finally, the zest and juice of a clementine or satsuma, whatever you've got. Oh, look at that orange snow and all the gleaming, gorgeous redness. I want the juice, but I can't be bothered to get a proper squeezer, just do it by hand. Get some pulp out this way too, which is good. So this needs to simmer for 20 minutes. And while that is happening, I can get on with rolling up my pastry. So this has cooled a little. So the pièce de résistance, some brandy, droplet of almond extract, slightly more generous splosh of vanilla, and a squirt of honey. Now I like to beat this quite a bit with my wooden spoon. Not that I want mush, but more just to encourage it to turn into very beaded paste. This beautiful cranberry studded mincemeat is cool, and so I can fill these teeny little pastry cases. If I could sing, I would be bursting into a carol now, but I really can't, so it's just going on inside my head. And what I find makes my life easier, which is important at all times, but never more so than at Christmas, is that I can cook all of these in one go, just in a hot oven for about 15 minutes. And then the ones that I want later, I will pop cooled in the deep freeze, ready to be reheated at a later date. And the thing is that frozen, thawed, reheated, they are still 
perfect, crisp pastry, gorgeous, spicy, gooey interior. I've come down into the icy depths to stash away my mince pies in the freezer. Not that they'll last very long there, I have to say, unlike a lot of the stuff I keep frozen. For example, I've got some chicken necks and feet bought in the hope that I would make some fantastic soup. They're known in the trade as walkie-talkies. And <laughs> that is some ostrich, a hangover from my rare meats phase. Short-lived, I have to say. But the thing about the deep freeze at this time of year is it's really a kind of seasonal store cupboard for instant meals. A case in point is my sweet potato and butternut soup. I have to have a regular supply of this at this time of year because it really is one of my firm freezer favourites. Peel and chop an onion and then chop and de-seed a butternut squash. Don't bother to peel it. Then don't bother to peel either a sweet potato, but slice it and put all three on a baking tray. Sprinkle with some cinnamon and nutmeg and drizzle over with some olive oil, regular stuff. Then put in a hot oven for about an hour. Perfect. I mean, this would be a fantastic no-fuss vegetable dish, just as it is. But for now, I'm after soup, so I'm going to blend it. The unpeeled sweet potato and butternut and the bits of almost charred but certainly softened onion go into the blender. It's better to do it in two or three batches, really. And now into the blender, about 500 mils of vegetable stock. And when I say stock, it's just hot water and vegetable bouillon granules. A teeny bit more. Right. It's quite helpful if you've got a blender with one of these sort of steam outlets at the top. Otherwise, wait till the soup is a bit cooler when you blend. The moment of truth. There. It could hardly be simpler. I do like a little flourish at the end, though, so against the sweet graininess of the soup, I'm going to add a drizzle of buttermilk, although you could use natural yoghurt, and blue cheese, salt and sour, against this honeyed richness. I know it looks a bit too thick right now, but I've got some more broth which I can use to thin it down and get it to just the right consistency. Thick and velvety, but not gloopy. If you're having this to help you after a Christmas party hangover, I suggest a few drops of really devilishly hot chilli oil. But for now, I'm content to make my blue cheese drizzle. Now, an advanced taste of the Christmas Stilton. Let's crumble it in. And although I like buttermilk, it can be hard to get, so any runny plain yoghurt is fine. So the salt here of the cheese and the sour tang of the buttermilk combine absolutely brilliantly. That's it. And we blitz again. Right, ready to pour. perfect counterpoint to this in colour as well as taste. Now, if you're making the soup in advance, you may find you want to add some liquid as you reheat. But for now, it's perfect, and I think I can afford a ladle or two. When I know you're near. And yes, I know my blue cheese swirl is a bit 80s. But you know, what's wrong in that? Mm. 
Nirvana for Noel. As we turn to go in our eyes we show it always hurts to say For me, Christmas is about the coziness, the comfort of traditions. And my way of heralding in the season is by making sure I'm at a table loaded with food and surrounded by friends. One of the suppers I like to do most for friends at this time of year is something which is luscious and sort of full of Eastern promise, a tagine studded with dates and cooked in pomegranate juice. And with this scented and spiced stew, I like to festoon and adorn it with my pomegranate and red onion relish. <laughs> a fantastic tangle of puce onion and scarlet beads and flecked with green coriander. But much as I love tradition, I adore making new discoveries and my latest and I have to say most enthusiastic discovery is for an American 1950s diner classic, the Girdle Buster Pie, which I've adapted and made my own by layering up crushed digestive biscuits with butter and chocolate <laughs> chips and then a cool smooth layer of coffee ice cream and on the top the gooeyest, chewiest bourbon lace butterscotch. And it's incredibly easy to make, not least because the freezer does all the work. First, you process some digestive biscuits along with some soft, unsalted butter and some chocolate chunks. You should end up with a damp, sandy rubble, which you just tip out and press into and up the sides of a flan dish. Put this into the freezer for about an hour to firm up. Slightly soften some good shop-bought coffee ice cream, just enough to be scooped and spread into the prepared case, and then cover with cling and stick this back into the freezer. And now for the Girdle Buster Pie's crowning glory. You do need to cook the butterscotch sauce, but it's not hard. Pour some golden syrup into a saucepan and melt it on a low heat with some butter and muscovado sugar. Now turn up the heat a bit and bring it to the boil and let it bubble away for five minutes. Now turn off the heat and add the bourbon. Then stir in some double cream and it's the cream that turns the caramel in the pan into a butterscotch sauce. Let this cool but not set. Then pour it gloopily and glossily over the ice cream layer in the flan dish. My chocolate laced with honey. This is a real seasonal splurge, but as Mae West said, too much of a good thing can be wonderful. The money. So if you're wise and realize that life has lit, yeah. Believe you me. Show him the door, cause rich is better. This tagine is the traditional way I kick off my seasonal spirit lifting suppers. Right, onions. Just need to be roughly chopped. There's something so reassuring I always find about the way so many recipes start with chop some onions. And in this tagine, these onions are cooked so softly and so slowly that they really infuse everything with glorious sweetness. And sweetness, I think, is both festive and comforting. And I mean, what better combination? So heat on, some oil, just flavorless vegetable oil or ordinary, not extra virgin olive oil will do. After Christmas, I use goose fat. And now the onions can cook. Oh, I love the sound of the sizzle. It's like when you have a fire and it crackles. 
such a cosy making sound. I should confess that I often call a stew a tagine just because I think it makes it all sound so much more exotically alluring. But this actually can properly be called a tagine because its inspiration is entirely Moroccan. So these onions are soft and now they can be spiced up because I'm after the scent of the souk. Cinnamon. Some turmeric to lend its fabulous goldness. Oh, I love the peppery warmth you get from ground ginger. Some ground cumin. For me, that is the scent of the Middle East. And finally, because this is a more is more time of year, some allspice. I'm telling you, you can dispense with the scented candles if you make this tagine. That's it, and I'm ready for my lamb. I'm going for diced leg here, and I have to say that even if you're not using a traditional tagine, and there's no need to, it's good to use a wide and shallow casserole simply because you can brown the meat more and you need less liquid. Do you know what? I'm going to put it all in at once. I probably shouldn't, but hey, let's live a little. You don't need to be too fastidious about browning the meat. I just want to stir slowly but thoroughly to give it a light searing. Now you can't have Christmas without dates. And there is something about having rich fruit in meat dishes that does feel even more Christmassy to me. Ugh. These are so gorgeously sticky. To punctuate that grainy sweetness of the dates, but to keep it in its exotic milieu, some pomegranate juice, that sour sharp tang, beautiful colour as well. Don't need too much. Top up with water. Now all I need is some salt and to give this a good stir. If you're using a regular casserole, you can just put the lid on and pop this in a really low oven for about two hours. But if you are using a tagine, you know, with its conical funnel-like lid, I mean, it almost turns this into an oven of its own and I can leave it there with its hat on, simmering gently for about two hours. And when my guests arrive, I have to say, they'll be met with the most fabulously welcoming smell. Too much of this actually, you really can't. Okay, some white rum. Can I hand you these for lychee your lychee? Now it has got a kick to it. I'm sure it has. Won't give you too much. It is, because I can't be peeled over, but I put some of the juice in the drink. Take the two bottles out. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to leave you just for a moment, only because I'm going to feed you before you drink more. Oh. <laughs> it's very hard to get any balance at this time of year, so you may as well go for it in the kitchen. So with the tagine, which is sort of soft and sweet, I want a bit of crunch and I want something sharp, and I'm making my red onion and pomegranate relish. And I've got a red onion here, which I'm gonna cut in half and then slice into fine half moons. Ready? And these go into the pomegranate juice. And on top of the pomegranate juice and the onions, I'm gonna add some lime juice. Now the lime juice, along with the pomegranate juice, offers acidity, which not only takes the harshness out of the onion, but it also helps make it a fantastic, almost lit up pink. 
Well, those are almost ready. The tagine is ready. I'll just pop this over there. Coming. I think I can bring this to the table without dropping it. I'll breathe in. OK, one more thing. Carry on without me. Right, time for the final jubilant assembly. You wait. Lift the macerated onion out of the steeping liquid. Beautifully pink. I'll be going with my hot pink tablecloth, which I'm very pleased about. And now some pomegranate seeds. And then some salt. And then some more pomegranates, because I cannot resist those beautiful jewels. And a little seasonal snipping by red scissors of coriander. It's all come together. Pomegranate and red onion relish, the tagine. It smells gorgeous. It smells like it. Time for the unveiling. I know, not subtle, was it? I put the B in subtle. <laughs> If I'm kicking off Christmas, I start as I mean to go on. This is no time for restraint. Hence, of course, the girdle buster and all its gluttony gratifying glory. Look at that. Oh, I just so love the mixture between crumbly, nubbly chocolatey biscuit and the smooth ice cream, so cold. And then, of course, that bourbon laced butterscotch. Don't say I never look after you. It's cruel, but it's necessary. Ah. You wait. It is what it says. 